All right, we are moving into a new series as a church together that we are simply calling Project Gratitude, and it says, Finding the Joy that God Intended. And the reason we are jumping into this this series, you know, one, of course, Thanksgiving is coming, and we usually try to be a little more grateful around Thanksgiving, right? Right? Yes, okay, that's good. We're, We're on a good start then. And so here we are, we're jumping into this series, and one of the reasons that we're doing so is because it seems like everywhere that we turn a lot of times, things are going negative, When we look at the news, it's nothing but apartment fires and shootings. And we look around and it's even when the economy is going well, we're in fear of a recession. We're worried about what's going to happen. No matter what sphere of the world we look in, people are telling us that it is just going down the drain. Whether we're looking at government or economics or whether we're looking at the markets or whatever it is, it can seem from our school systems to families and teens to, to social media, wherever we turn, we can find negativity, right? Our news systems actually thrive on it. They, they want you to, fear, to feel fear and anger so that you have these negative emotions so that you'll tune in again to have somebody else who agrees with you and feels that same fear and that same anger. No matter which side of the aisle you're on or economics or whatever it is, these are the ways and the tactics that they get us to tune in. So everywhere that we go, we are sold this bill of goods that things are going poorly, that that things are not going to work out, and that we should live in fear of the future. Do you ever live in fear of the future? You're like, yeah, every day, right? Depending on your age, that future, you know, kind of comes or goes sooner or later, and, and we live in fear of this. And so, but here as people of God, we have something else to confess. We have something else that speaks into this life that can be so full of fear. You know, God says all throughout scriptures, do not fear. I've even heard it said in one of those popular movies like Facing the Giants. Uh, uh, Anybody in here a University of Georgia fan? Of course not. Um, (laughs) Now everybody's South Carolina fans. We won't talk about that. And so, but in this moment, Mark Ricks came on to the film and he was saying that the Bible says 365 times, do not fear. Now, I don't know if that's accurate. I believe and trust Mark Richt, but 365 times, that's one for every day of the year. Do not fear, but it is so hard not to fear. It is so hard not to be afraid, to worry about where the economy is going, to worry about what's going on with my body, to worry about what's going to happen in my finances, to worry about who my neighbors are going to be or whatever it is that you worry about. It is hard not to worry, to fear, to think that things are bad and that they're only getting worse. But I look around and I see so much reason for joy. I see so much reason for celebration and thanksgiving and I feel the worry and fear just as much as you do. But there is goodness in this world. We're going to look at Proverbs eleven twenty seven 27 this morning. It's going to throw it up on the screen real quick for us. And it says, if you search for good, you will find favor. But if you search for evil, it will find you. And so our question for ourselves this morning is when we wake up in the morning and we flip on the news or we, we make that first phone call or we drive into the day, are we looking for the good or are we looking for the negative or the evil? You see, we get together here each week during our time of care for one another in prayer, and we ask you, where have you seen God at work in the world around you? And we do that, obviously, on purpose, but we do it because God is at work in the world around us, but it can be so hard to see sometimes because we are blinded by the negativity and the fear and the worry, whether it's from the outside or whether it's from our inside. But we want to be a people that look for the good. I love this term, search, to search. We talked about in the series about going fishing, right, on Go Fish, about how the shepherd searches for the lost one. And we use the analogy of what it means to have lost a child and to have gone searching for them at Walmart or the ballpark or or the festival or whatever it would be, and that feeling of fear that just builds up in you to where you don't think you're gonna be able to stand it before. And that is the feeling that search conveys when we read the scriptures. We search for the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost person, but we search for the good in this world. You know, sometimes, I'm not going to get you to raise your hand on this one. Please don't raise your hand. But do you actually enjoy the negative? Some of us need a little bit of conviction in that area. We are people who enjoy the drama, so to speak. We enjoy the bad news or the people who have fallen down and been hurt 
We enjoy the people who have had drama go on in their life, and we enjoy being the ones who get to spread it. And are we making the world a better place when we do that? The answer is absolutely not. Because we are continuing to spread the evil, the negative, and the bad instead of being a people who find the good, find the place where God is already at work in this world. And that is what we share. You see, you can run into somebody who's an optimist or a pessimist, and they can be blessed in the exact same ways. And the optimist will say, my cup runneth over. I am so blessed. You will not believe how good things are. Wayne Dillon in this church, I love seeing him every Sunday. Amy's husband, that's why I pointed at Amy. She's not Wayne. But I say, Wayne, how are you doing? And, and he says, I just couldn't be any better. I just couldn't be any better. Is that his exact quote? Something like that, right? And you know how I walk away feeling from just that one interaction? I actually feel a little better, right? Like I was like, well, what's so great about him that he couldn't feel any better and I feel this way, Right? <laughs> No, but just interacting with somebody who's positive. You walk up to people and say, how are you doing? And they say, if I was any better, I'd be twins. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but it sounds like they feel really good about life, right? But some people you can walk up to and everything could have been going well in their life. And you ask them, how are you doing? And they're like, oh my gosh, my cup runneth over. Look at the huge mess it's made. <laughs> right? I've got so much money, I've got more problems than you would believe. I've got so much time on my hands, I don't even know what to do with it. Here's the one I fall into. I've got so many kids that they're just stressing me out. <laughs> right? My cup runneth over, and I don't know what to do with this huge mess. Why would God do this to me? Right? So we run into these people everywhere. You and I, we are those people. And at different times, sometimes we're the optimist, sometimes we're the pessimist. But here's what I want to tell you this morning. I think too often, and this is what we find in Scripture, we're going to walk through some today in Romans 8. If you're looking for something to study this upcoming week, please pick up Romans 8 and read through it. It's a tremendous, <coughs> excuse me, look at Paul's uh, kind of philosophy and theology. But one of the things you want to read and one of the things we want to understand is that a lot of times we think that our hope and our joy is tied to what we feel and what we see, right? Right? My optimism, my hope and joy too often is tied to how I feel. When I wake up in the morning, whether I think it's going to be a great day or a bad day, usually has to do with how my, whether my head hurts or my back hurts or whether the kids were up before me making a mess or whatever it is. How I feel determines whether I'm an optimistic or a hopeful person or a person that sees and finds the joy in life. But what I want us to know today is that our optimism is not based on how we feel. It's based on what God says. And we come together on a very unique Sunday. All Saints Sunday is just one time a year, and it is a high, holy Sunday. I even wore a suit for it. Can you believe it? Because it is a special day. It is special because the people that we have lost, the people that we have loved that brought us joy and hope and optimism, for the people who poured into our lives through Sunday school or youth workers or just being radiant joy when we walk into the sanctuary and we saw them. Whether we get to visit with them or whatever it was, they helped us see the good in life and we believed in better and we believed in something even better than life itself because of them. And we come together on this day as a church to say we, like them, believe in something that is even better than life itself, eternal life. And so we come to say that, you know what, sometimes I don't always feel so good. And, and the things that I see going on around me in the world, I'm going to be honest with you, they, I'm worried sometimes. But I see places of hope. I see places of joy and I find that in what God says, I have room for optimism and hope. We're going to look at Romans 8 verses 1 through 2 to start us in this, in this journey together this morning as we move our way towards Holy Communion. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that one again because I think we need to hear it. I want you to hear this this morning. So now there is no condemnation for you. Because of Jesus the Christ. If we were another type of church, we might say amen at that point. 
there is no condemnation. How often, that was good, we got a snort back there. That was pretty awesome. (laughs) That usually means I messed up. There is no condemnation for you through Jesus the Christ. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So like Miss Kim this morning, bringing that stuffed animal and this analogy, we would be that stuffed animal. And God says, that one belongs to me. And everywhere I go, I am taking that one with me. Except we are not going to, God is not going to outgrow us. God is not going to think that we are too childish anymore. God is going to say, I love you because I made you, because you are a part of me, and I'm going to take you everywhere I go, and everything that you do, I am going to be searching for you. Have you ever lost a little kid stuffed animal before? That's what it means to search. God loves us like these toddlers love their stuffed animals. God is chasing after us. You belong to God. You see, no matter, let's go to that next quote for me, if you don't mind, please. My sins are forgiven, and my eternity is secure. You see, that's what I read in Romans 8, verses 1 through 2 for us this morning, is that my sins are forgiven. There is no condemnation for me because of Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for you because of Jesus Christ. The worst thing is never the last thing for Christians. Do you catch that? Because we are forgiven, our eternity is secure. People run and hide from the death and destruction that goes on in this world, but Christians are able to rush to it and stand there and say, I have something to offer and that something is not me and it is better than this life altogether. Your sins can be forgiven and your eternity can be secure. This thing that has troubled you so much, it will not on you because you don't belong to it. You belong to God. This pain that your body is going through, it may take you from this earth, but it will not take you from joy and love and eternity. Because your sins are forgiven and your eternity is secure. Whatever you are in, I don't know what you're in. I know what some of you are in, but I don't know what all of you are in. Call on God. I don't know what is going on with your body or your finances or your marriage or your relationship with your parents or your children's or your business or whatever it may be. But here I am to tell you this morning that God loves you. God has forgiven you. You are not condemned. Your eternity is secure and God wants you to call on God so that God can be there for you. Romans 8 verse 18 Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. James says this really weird thing that makes me frustrated sometimes, but he says that he considers these trials joy. He considers it joy to face these trials of life that he was going through. And what I want you to take away from that this morning is that your present pain is not going to take away your future victory. Let's go to the next quote. Your future victory is greater than your present pain. My future victory is greater than my present pain. Because yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Now, we don't say that to scoff at suffering. No way. It is real and it hurts and it is scary and it leaves us in fear and anger and we understand. God doesn't say, pretend like none of that is real and pretend like you're happy all the time. That is not what God says. God says, I am there with you in the midst of your pain. I am there with you in the midst of your worry. I am there with you in the midst of your anger and fear. And I want you to know and to trust that even though this may be the last thing for you on this earth, it is not the final thing for you because I love you. Your present pain will not outshine your future glory. Romans eight twenty eight. this has been one that is favorite of mine throughout my life. 
And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, people who haven't, haven't studied this will sometimes say things like, everything happens for a reason. Have y'all ever heard that before? Right? Well, we say, no way. It doesn't. What this verse says to us is that everything that happens, God can bring good from it. God doesn't say everything that happens to you is good. God doesn't say everything that happens to you is something that I gave you. There is evil and there is hurt and there is pain and there is wrong in this world. Sometimes from ourselves or from others or from governments or whatever it may be. There are bad things in this world and God does not cause them. But God can take those things of hurt and pain and strife and disease and God can begin to do good even in the midst of that pain. We know that in this world, we will have pain and we will have trouble. We know in this world that we will one day go from life to death. But what God is saying is that in the midst of all that, not only am I with you, but I will be with you and I will help good things come from this moment. When I look around and I see this in action, we've talked about this before, but the most powerful place that I see this begin to get lived out is in in those who have experienced something like an addiction. And when they begin to get over it and they begin to become a sponsor and to invite other people into 12-step programs and places where they can begin to get help, God says, I know that you are in the midst of hurt and pain and I am with you. And now on the other side of this thing, you can change this world for the better. People who have gone through hurt and disease and on the other side, they seek out like God does and find people who are going through the same hurt and disease and bring them hope and companionship and care and love and answers. We are a people of hope. No matter what, God can use it for good. No matter what, God can use it for good. And finally, where we're going to wrap it up today in Romans 8, 38 through 39, you've heard this, there's tons of of worship songs about it, but, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Now, in the midst of our pain and hurt, I'm not so sure we're thinking about what does or doesn't separate us from God's love. We're just thinking about ourselves. But when we begin to turn and look towards the eternal or we begin to cry out for help in those moments, even though we may not hear and feel God near us, God is yelling to us, I am with you, I love you, I am for you, I am working it for good and nothing can separate you from me on this earth or in the eternity to come. And just to help us understand it a little better, Paul goes in here in Romans and begins to explain it in our everyday terms. Neither death nor life. We have come together on All Saints Day to say that neither death nor life separates us from the love of God. That neither death nor life separate us from our loved ones in a way that will last through eternity. That love has lasted since the beginning and will continue. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons. When we begin to think about evil and its supernatural forms and things like that, God is saying these things will not separate you from God. If you live your life believing that those things can stand between you and who God has called you to be and who you will spend eternity with, then you have missed the point. Your future is secure. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. That's when it gets a little more personal, doesn't it? Not even our fears for today and our worries about tomorrow, which, oh my goodness, they are so many. Not even that can separate us from God's love. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Not even the powers of hell. Do you catch that? Not even hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. And when I read that, I begin to think that means even me. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed 
in Christ our Lord. It doesn't matter where we go. It doesn't matter what we do. Our God loves us and is chasing after us and wants to be in relationship with us no matter what happens to us. Our future is secure. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. You see, this morning, church, we are not optimistic because of what we feel. Feelings can be manufactured. Feelings have to do with circumstances and dispositions and chemicals in our brains. We are optimistic because of what God says, because of who God is. Where do you need these words in your life today? What are the worries that you are bringing with you to this time together? As we come together in holy communion, we are going to remember that we are forgiven and secure, that our future victory is greater than our present pain, that everything that is happening to us, that God can use it for good, and that ultimately nothing will ever, can ever, shall ever separate us from the love of God. And so this morning, no matter what you are bringing to this communion rail, no matter what is weighing you down on the outside or the inside, no matter what burden you are carrying, God is asking you to come, to come to this table, to be a people that confess when we are wrong like we did earlier in the service, and to ask for forgiveness and to enjoy communion with God and with one another. Because no matter where we are, God's love is there for us. And this morning we experience that through Holy Communion.